once again we seek mercy so that we might find grace thank you father in the name of Jesus hallelujah once again you are welcome we are pressing deep in the spirit you know it takes time for a man to gather momentum to take a flight in spiritual journeys you need to trap a lot of spiritual discipline together in order for you to take that trip that trip that is powered by the mercy of God and then you lay hold on things that will establish you please welcome someone as you take your seat Genesis chapter 1 Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. The scripture of interest is verse 26. I'd like us to look a little bit on this personality that is designed by God to be the warden of the earth. And how exactly the God intend for him to exercise dominion. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, let's take another scripture quickly to support that because this, if you read, if you read properly, you will find that this entity is supposed to be the warden of the earth. The one under whose hand the earth has been entrusted. And this is divine order. This is how God intended it. Psalms 115 verse 16 will also be a scripture for us to consult in establishing this fact. Psalms 115 verse 16 says, The heaven... Even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. The implication of this scripture is that God, by an act of a royal decree, has willed the earth to us as men. So when we talk about the warding of the earth, it will be any entity that the earth legitimizes is entrance into the domain that can influence the landscape. There is something deliberate that you will need to do to bring God upon the scene. There is something deliberate that you will need to do to bring the devil upon the scene. Just in case you notice that in your family, the influence of Satan is pronounced. Don't blame Satan. Someone somewhere in your family was the one that came into partnership with the devil and set up an altar that will legitimize the activities of Satan within that landscape. Hallelujah. Because the earth has he given unto the sons of men. It is from this standpoint that I like to define what prayer is. Prayer, as you have heard me say again and again, is earthly permission for heavenly interference. That's what priesthood is. We are creating a pathway for God to have the legitimacy to begin to influence 
the issues of men. It is an altar that creates that legitimacy. When God utters his words, he doesn't turn back on the things that he has said. God means what he says. God says what he means. The first time words were used in the Bible, it was not for communication, it was for creation. The entire landscape of creation as we know it until this day was brought into existence by an act of God's authority. God exercised his authority in his spoken word and the consequence of that authority was creation. And Jesus revealed while he walked this world that he was actually the creator from the beginning because creation still recognized the authority that put it together. And when Jesus said, peace be still to the wind, the wind obeyed him. Are you with me? That's how powerful the utterances of God are. And it's the same authority that God has used to create jurisdiction for humankind, saying that the earth belongs to the children of men. From the day that decree was made, it, is, it will be illegal if God decides to come into the terrain without an invitation. It is this reality that makes priesthood and the science of altars a critical matter. It happens to be that you are not the only member of your family. You also have other members in your family. And whereas you have refused to allow either God or Satan to come into the family, some others, before you could make up your mind, have already invited Satan. The patterns and the trends that we see in the family do not reveal such as should be obtainable if God were in charge. It means we have patterns that violate the expectations of Scripture for a people that are held under the favor of God. These patterns have been made possible because of the presence of entities that have been welcomed into the domain and the instrumentality by which this invitation can be extended to spirit beings to have legitimacy to operate in this realm is what we have come to study. So I said I need to give us elaborate definitions of what an altar is. Because by next week, we will be talking about how to establish a personal altar. The issue of altars is not a theoretical issue. So if the things that I'm teaching are true, we should be able to practice it, practicalize it in this place. You know, one of the deadly things that happened to us in the body of Christ is that we became theoretical people, giving out keys as pastors. And most of you have receive so many keys, and your key holders can no longer bear them. And looking back after many years of receiving keys, your life has not advanced. The matter of which we speak is not a matter that is theoretical. It is verifiable. And as we teach and instruct, as much as possible, we will practice. So we want to devote Sundays for practice. We'll do theory Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then we'll do practical on Sunday. I need to tell you beforehand that uh, 
I have an appointment with the U.S. Embassy sometime this month. Wait, wait. So I will tell you when I'm going to the embassy. But my absence will not stop the protocol. It is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, theory. Whether I'm here or not on Sunday, there will be practical on Sunday. Exactly. Now, the reason why I'm not rushing is because I want you to understand it enough for you to implement. At the end of June, we will compare notes if you are beginning to get results from what I am teaching. So we'll, we'll create an, a feedback avenue in June for you to come up with your experience in the practice of these matters. If you are still with me, say, Amen. So the subject of altars is central to enabling God to interfere legally with the world of men. So the summary of the subject of altars is a strategy by which we can allow God legally interfere with the world of men. I took a study of the Bible and I found out that one of those men that revealed that the way God ordained human life is that every human being must have an altar in every location where he or she spends his life. You must have an altar at home, for instance, and if you run a business, you must have an altar that powers that your business. Those of you that are into buying and selling and into business, you know the stories that we hear at Modern Market again and again, how people bring things to help enhance sales. You are going to be very ignorant if you think you can make profitable sales where there are competitors and you have no altar backing your trade initiative. All you came with is a business, a degree in business management from Benue State University. Your doubts will be cleared when you come into the economic war front because it takes power to get wealth. I speak in parables. Hallelujah. Okay. So in view of the fact that God has given unto the children of men this territory called the earth, it is only entities that are invited that have the legitimacy to operate here. I need to give you a few scriptures before I begin my definition. One scripture that comes to mind so powerfully is the book of Matthew chapter 18, beginning from verse 18. All of these scriptures reveal earthly permission for heavenly interference. Matthew 18, verse number 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever he shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Are you there? Do you notice that this entire protocol must be initiated upon the face of the earth? In order to get heaven involved, earth must take the initiative, earth must, must propel the process with an activity of priesthood. Verse 19. Are you there in 19? And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Do you still, have you still noticed 
that is the earth that initiates the process. Nothing will happen if the earth keeps silent. When there is silence in the earth, it means that the heavens have been bound from entry. It is the initiative that arises from the earth that attracts heaven's attention. But so ever ye shall bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall lose on earth, it shall be loosed where? In heaven. Heaven will become involved the moment earth takes the initiative. In fact, you are likely to be able to take advantage of the resources that are available in heaven if you understand priesthood. Setting up an altar is the wisest thing that a mortal can do because by so doing, you can get reinforcement from heaven. By so doing, you can be connected to heaven. By so doing, you can use the resources of heaven. And so Abraham was one of those people that discovered that human life is a danger if there is no spiritual re reinforcement, no spiritual covering, no spiritual impute that swallows up the insufficiency of human life. Our, our African elders discovered this insufficiency in humankind, and that was the reason why they joined themselves to vicious demons, very vicious devils. It is as a result of the knowledge of the insufficiency of humankind that prompted them to ally themselves with demonic spirits that promise to have the ability to provide reinforcement, covering, protection, and what have you. But the Bible is saying that we can maximize the resources of heaven if it takes the initiative to set up an altar. We can connect heaven to it and we can take advantage of the resources that are domiciled in heaven if the people upon the face of the earth have the spiritual knowledge that is required to bring heaven into partnership. Are you, are you, are you with me? In all of the cases that I'm going to present before you, you will realize that earth must take the initiative. And just in case you've been silent all these years, you are a culprit that has partnered with the wicked people in your family to allow Satan rule among your people. Just in case there are patterns that you have seen. Hallelujah. Oh my. Oh, you are fasting. Hallelujah. Okay. Did you get that? Okay. So the effort must begin from the earth. Okay, let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11 quickly. Hebrews chapter 11 before I begin to build gradually. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read verse 6. That's my verse of emphasis. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God. That, that other statement doesn't apply to everybody. It only applies to those that want to come to God. If you want to come to God, that, is, that means you want to deal with God. Only people that intend to deal with God get to see the dynamics of God in their space. I've seen so many people trying to book counseling times, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if my experience in counseling ministry means anything, 70% of the people that come for counseling, what they are hoping to meet is a superstar 
someone that has a plug, the plug from heaven. He can regulate things and make things happen at the spur of the moment. Now, most of them are not coming because they want to participate with heaven. No, they are not planning to come to God. They believe that they have tried so well by coming to a man. Hallelujah. Meanwhile, if you have seen the spirit of the teaching that we have been doing since we started this platform, we've been equipping people so that they will have capacity to do it themselves. God is free to all. God is, is, is merciful to all. It's not an attempt to create superstars that people will need to come and know. They, yes, if you have the opportunity to come, why not? And I'm not saying that the fact that you are strong doesn't, is revealed in the fact that you are alone and you don't interact with other people. No. I'm just giving you a record of my stewardship in the area of counseling. Most of the people that come are not planning to do any business with God, but they are hoping to benefit from your own allocation with God. As good as that is, and as much as possible as we meet with people, we try to bring service to them by the Holy Ghost. The purpose of God is not that you depend upon a man. The purpose of God is that you will establish your own altar and you will do business with God. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, He that cometh to God. There are a few rules that apply just in case you want to come to God and those rules only apply to those that come to God. The fact that you are in a conference now, listening to how altars are, you know, why it is necessary for you to have an altar and to function in the life of the tent and the altar, doesn't mean that you will go back and apply the things that you are learning. Because not every man is willing to come to God. You are never going to see the supernatural in your space, God coming to swallow up your insufficiency and put you on a pedestal where Satan will not be able to reach you if you refuse to come to God. Meanwhile, just in case you have an intention to come to God, there are two rules that apply. First rule, is faith. First rule is faith. And the reason why the first rule is faith is because you are going to do business with the intangible. If you are doing business with the intangible, doing business with the invincible, you cannot do it outside of faith. Those, those are our relatives that manage altars for Satan. You need to know how powerful their faith is. Are you there? <laughs> they believe that thing. They believe it. They believe it. Once you want to do business with the invincible realm, you cannot succeed if you are not willing to believe in the entity that, that governs that space. You'll be confronted with a rude requirement if you want to deal with God. And the rude requirement is faith in the invincible. Faith in the intangible. Faith in such things that your, your physical senses cannot verify. If you are not ready for that kind of adventure, there is no need for you to deal with God. Because the primary requirement for such pilgrimage is faith. Do you realize why faith is a basic, in fact, the way of life of the believer? You know, the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. This corrupt world of ours is not a good place for a just man. In fact, a just man is going to suffer 
backlash just because he holds his ground. And God is aware of the, the partiality. That the pendulum is likely going to tilt in the direction of a man that is unjust. Because of that, he decided to help us by creating a way for just people to survive. And he called it faith. He that cometh to God must believe faith. Faith becomes the key. So, when, <laughs> are you there? You are there. All right, so when you now come and you, we say, okay, we are going to go on 91 days prayer. And then you get excited and you join the prayer. And you pray for 45 days and it seems nothing is happening. The reason why it occurred to you that nothing was happening was because demons have started playing with your mind. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm an experienced man in this matter. By God's mercy, I have authority in the issues that I am talking to you about. You know, one time Paul says, I speak as a man that has received mercy of the Lord to be trustworthy. He's talking about the authority has gathered by reason of his spiritual experience. On the matters that I speak of, I have gathered experience that makes me an authority in this field. And I do not say that boastfully. I say that in the spirit of Apostle Paul. On the 45th day, you felt as if nothing was happening. The reason why it occurred to you, that's your sense of evaluation. The reason why it occurred to you was because Satan is trying to sway you away from that requirement. He that cometh to God must believe. If you have never seen how doing business with the invincible realm produces results, if you have never seen it before, Satan will ensure that you will never see it by swaying you away from this number one requirement so that you become fed up of continuing. You know, I told you, in this field, I have authority. And I did not know why a certain fast that I did, I, I was at liberty to, to be marking the calendar. When I finished one day, I mark. So I have, I took inventory of how long it took before God responded to me so that I can teach somebody tomorrow. There are many things I did like research. So I have time. I have dates. I have all those particulars to help you understand the protocol that we're about to engage in. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. You just remembered. Meanwhile, the parameters with which you were using to judge whether your initiative was effective were physical parameters. So the devil will always want to bring you back into the realm of sight and the realm of senses. But he that comes to God must be ready to do business on the strength of his faith because he wants to transact with intangible things that his physical senses cannot verify. So please help me ask your neighbor, are you ready to transact with the invincible? When witches cast a spell in the night, it is most likely that early in the morning they will come to check if it worked. It, it means they believed what they did. Is the effect, oh my. Are you, are you still following what I'm talking about? Now, this is a complete, complete module. The third week, in the third week of this teaching, I will show you how your own altar can swallow another altar. I will show you. The, it's in the Bible. It's, it's in the Bible. Those days, I used to study the Bible in a hurry. But now, I discovered when I rush, I don't see. Everything is in the Bible. Everything is in the Bible. Are you still there? Yes, sir. So you say, he that cometh to God must believe. 
must have faith. I found out that witches have more faith than we do. Yes, most times. Witches are very dogged, they are very faithful, they are very consistent, and the reason why they are consistent is because they believe. You cannot maintain any form of consistency. Sister, you with cap, you are the one I'm talking about. You can't maintain consistency. Mm, mm, mm. You can't. You can't. If it rains, you will say, oh, there's an imbalance, there's an imbalance. Then you, you forget your commitment. It's because you, don't, you are not ready to walk with the invincible. I went to preach somewhere in Western Nigeria, and when I got there, the minister that ministered before me, who happens to be, I think, the last surviving disciple of Apostle Babalola, that, that learned their ways of prayer, last, the last of them. So he ministered before me, and uh, they told him that I'm, I'm the next minister. So we got into town, went straight to our lodging to rest and all of that. He sent the pastor to call me. That he wants to, he wants to see that man. Meanwhile, the person I'm talking about doesn't have physical eyes. But he said he wants to see that man. So we rushed there. And you will know that this man has another eye. Hey. The man has another eye. He doesn't need physical eyes. That's a man that has done business with the supernatural realm for long. The sight he received in the spirit was a very powerful replacement for his physical eyes. Oh, you're not with me. Oh, you believe that is not in the Bible. Huh? Come with me. Let me show you a scripture. Give me Isaiah chapter 11 verse 3. Because I want to know how many of us are are really ready to do business with the invisible. Because when you want to do business with the invisible, you don't look at the cloud or the wind. No, we don't look at physical. No, no, no. The way results come from spiritual transaction is not according to the progressions that is suggestive of such a manifestation in the natural. It was Elisha that told them, he said, dig ditches. You may not see cloud, and you may not see rain, but the ditches shall be filled with water. It, it only men that do business with the intangible can make such statements. This is Isaiah chapter 11, and I know you know Isaiah chapter 11. The subject of Isaiah chapter 11 is the grace that is on the Messiah. If you read Isaiah chapter 11 very, very carefully, you will find out that Isaiah 11 is pointing to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Just take time and read it. You will come to the same conclusion. Now, this is the anointing that will operate on the Messiah. I left verse 1 and verse 2 because my interest is verse 3. Ah. Go to verse 1. If we can't talk about verse 3 without verse 1. He said, There shall come forth a root out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall go, grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Okay, the Spirit of the Lord. Have you seen it? Go to verse 3 now. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This Spirit of the Lord that shall rest upon him shall make him quick, of quick understanding in the fear of God such that he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ear. If you have an electronic Bible, click on quick understanding. It's, it's one word in the Hebrew. It's called ruach. Have you confirmed it? Ruach. What's the meaning of ruach? Breath. Have you seen it? Any confirmation there? Oh, no confirmation. 
It means we don't have an electronic, nobody has an electronic Bible to confirm it. I, I want you to, I, I don't want you to think that I'm making up things. Anybody with a Bible, an electronic Bible that's equipped with a lexicon? Yeah, so have you confirmed that it's rock? It's rock. He shall make thee of ruach understanding. So there's an understanding that comes through ruach, through the breath of God. And that understanding is superior to the sight of your eyes. It can be a replacement for sight. It can be a replacement for hearing. Because the man I saw, he was without physical eyes, but the man could see me. I saw the, you know me, I see in scripture. So I saw this scripture fulfilled before my face. Meanwhile, that's a man that fake pastors in his city are afraid to see him. Because when you, when you come to him, he will say you are fake and he will, he will tell you, if you visit again, I'll curse you. Yes. So fake pastors don't come close to him. He was the one that sent for me. I didn't, I didn't, we were sleeping. He told me the prayer point that was on my heart. He, he picked the prayer point and told me uh, he, that God has answered this thing that you've been. Ruach. That when the breath of God hits your regenerated spirit, are you there? They are not here. Okay, this is Jesus in the book of John chapter 3. Said so there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that's verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This was Jesus' explanation for what it meant to be born again. This was the opportunity Jesus had to define what it meant to be born again. Instead of definition, he gave an illustration. Jesus will always dodge definitions. He did definition only one time. It's the Apostle Paul that, that deals in definitions. But Jesus will escape it. He says... Except a man be born again. This is Jesus' description of what it means to be born again. And his description of what it means to be born again is experiential and not definitive. Except a man be born again, are you there? He cannot see the kingdom of God. It means that the proof that the Holy Ghost is indwelling your heart is that he gives you perception of what is obtainable in the realm of God. For your information, the Greek word for see is ido. And ido means to perceive by reason of the use of senses. Do you remember when you were in the womb at nine months, you had eyes, but the eyes were not meant for the womb. So that you couldn't see in the womb. Is that true? You had ears when you were nine months, fully developed. But the ears were not active in the womb because they were not designed for the womb. You had to be born first before your eyes became relevant. You had to be born first before your ears became relevant. And Jesus is saying, when you are now born again, there are spiritual senses built into your spirit. But you need to be born again in order for those senses to become relevant. That's what... The word, the, the Greek word idol means you need to be born into the realm of the Lord. Born into the realm of God. And when the spirit of God breathes upon your spirit man, what it produces is that perception now begins to come of the realm of God. That's why the word there was ruach. So when, 
when the Holy Ghost comes to indwell your regenerated human spirit, it comes with perception. Do you, you understand that? That perception is what I'm saying can be a very powerful replacement for the sight of your eyes and for the hearing of your ears. For he shall make him of ruach understanding in the fear of God and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes nor the hearing of his ears. If you are going to do business with the realm of God, you your navigating system will be ruach, will be that perception that comes from the Holy Ghost because your physical senses are no longer valuable for such transactions. Oh, you are not following me. You will use your spiritual perceptions as the organ of sensing when you are traveling in the realm of the spirit. He that cometh to God, he must believe. He must believe. The stepping stone into those possibilities is called faith. Are you there? Now, I, I, as we come into the practical aspect of this matter, I would have loved to give us... Okay, today is Friday. Ah, thank God. I'll do it tomorrow. I will show you what Roak does. There are eight forms of perception that you can receive through your spiritual senses. So we'll do a brief refresher course on those matters. Because when you begin to trouble the spirit realm, trouble the realm, trouble, there will be feedback from the realm. And the feedback will come in, term, in, in form of perceptions. Perceptions that you secure on your spirit man. If I don't teach you about perceptions, about the use of your receptacle, then this lecture is in vain. When you begin to knock on the door of heaven, heaven is going to respond. But they will not respond in your natural language. Jesus was the one that says, the word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So they are, they are words that are valid words, but yet those words are spirit. They are spirit words. And there are eight kinds of spirit words that you must be acquainted to, with because that is how the feedback of all your interactions will take place. So if you want to evaluate your, your pilgrimage in the spirit, you don't eval evaluate it with a proof in the natural. We evaluate it with feedback. Feedback that comes through Ruach. Are you there? If you know what I'm talking about, you can see danger before it comes. You will know that, ah, I need to take a journey of fasting because of your perception. You are not a strong man around the altar if you don't know how God responds when you make an effort to secure his attention. So what we are talking about here is that we have left the realm of the natural and the instrument with which we are using to navigate is called faith because we are dealing with the realm of the intangible, we are dealing with the realm of the invincible. And there's a way that invincible realm registers his wisdom upon the spirits of men. So tomorrow we are going to do that refresher course so that we can know what to expect when God begins to descend on your tarmac. Hallelujah. Are you there? The second thing that you need to know is that spiritual efforts, efforts of spiritual nature attract rewards. Because one of the things that Satan uses to afflict people and to stop them from engaging is that he comes to make you feel that you have wasted time. So the Bible says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. The requirement of faith cannot be compromised. And that he is a rewarder, oh my, of them that diligently seek him. 
I know you heard me, but you didn't hear me. Let me make you hear me. Are you, are you there? Are you heard with this, you didn't hear. In order to make you hear me, I need to take you to Matthew chapter 6 to enhance your hearing. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. The objective of this endeavor is to ensure that you heard what I said. Are you there in Matthew 6, 5? It says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner, corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. This is Jesus trying to labor in capacity building to bring his disciples to the point of understanding of the great art of prayer. And it will interest you to know that this effort of Jesus to bring education about prayer was, he came on demand. The disciples came to him and requested, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. It's, it's not as if Jesus did not want to teach them. But Jesus was not willing to teach them if they don't request. So this was in response to a demand, response to a request. One of the matters that Jesus brought forth here is that he began with definition of terminology. The first terminology he defined in attempting to teach about prayer is hypocrite. Is what? Meanwhile, still in the effort of teaching about prayer, he thought about, he still prayer, he thought about giving. Then he now thought about prayer. Then he now thought about fasting. The same, in the same breath. And he revealed that there was a giving hypocrite, there was a prayer hypocrite, and there was a fasting hypocrite. So hypocrites exist along these three lines. And Jesus did not want any of the disciples that came to request for this education to end up as a hypocrite. So he defined who a hypocrite can be in the prayer angle, in the giving angle, and in the fasting angle. The question I, I have to ask is why is Jesus spending so much time to talk about the subject of a hypocrite. Why? Have you thought about it? Because me, I, when I studied the Bible, I would, I would say, wait, wait, wait. Then I'll go and think first. Why is Jesus investing so much time to talk about hypocrites? Because it is very easy for you to stop the real transaction and stop at being a hypocrite and be benefiting from being a hypocrite. A hypocrite never gets to interface with the realm of the spirit. Huh? Because the audience that the hypocrite wants to capture is a natural audience. So his business stops at the natural gate. He doesn't travel into the supernatural gate. Somebody, may, somebody left home, and the reason why he came to church is because he wants to give to God. But his effort ended up at the natural gate. And God is not even aware that such an effort was made at all. Are you there? So Jesus had to define where hypocrite was. Now listen to me. Okay, 
Let me give you. He said, these hypocrites, the prayer hypocrite, because I don't want to go into the giving hypocrite, it will take time. The prayer hypocrite likes to pray standing in the synagogue. Likes to pray standing at the corners of the street. And the objective of his effort is so that he will be seen by men. You know, we're talking about engaging the spirit realm. But the hypocrite doesn't get there. The attention that the hypocrite captures is the attention of men. And guess what Jesus says in response to the efforts, the prayer efforts of the hypocrite? Guess what he says? He says, verily I say unto you, they have what? Now, the question is, when you set out to pray, why are you praying? Help, somebody help me. You want what? You want answers, not reward. It's answers you want. That's the reason why you pray. But Jesus is revealing something here that prayer has reward. Meanwhile, you came to look for answer, but God is willing to give you reward. Oh, you didn't get that? He says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Did he say, and, and he answers? <laughs> you are the one that is looking for an answer. But what God wants to give you for your effort are rewards. These are two different things that I need to introduce you to. You've been looking for answers for too long. Why God wants to give you a reward. It is the reward. The hypocrite can get answers. So. It is the reward that the hypocrite is disqualified from accessing. Meanwhile, everyone that comes to do business with God is entitled to the reward. But the hypocrite will never get the reward, even though he may even get answers. So you'll find scriptures that say, call unto me, and I will answer you. Because the reason why you call is because you wanted an answer. So he said, call unto me, I will answer you. And in addition to the answer, I will give you reward. I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Do you realize that you did not ask for the showing? You only ask for answers. But God uses your attempt to, to storm the spirit realm as an excuse to give you rewards. Things that will equip you. Things that will give you more insight in the initiative, in the project, in the spiritual adventure. And make you more robust so that you can actually see what he's offering, which is over and above what you are asking. Many times there's a problem with what you're asking. You're asking out of your limited insight, asking out of your limited understanding, asking out of, of your limitation. He comes, he gives you the answers to what you ask for, and then he, he, he shows you what? Great and mighty things that is beyond your knowledge. Now, don't read scriptures and run away and claim you understand it. What does it mean when the Bible says, I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not? What does it mean? Have you taken time to ask yourself? What is that? Oh, you are not answering. So don't worry, we will cut that off. I know, you, you see, don't get used to the sound of scripture, it's sweet. <laughs> ask yourself, what is the meaning? You don't ask. Oh my. Oh my. May the Lord make us diligent people. Amen. Diligent people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There are two ways God speaks. Two ways. Every attempt of God to communicate with any human being, falls into two categories. One is inspiration. The second one is revelation. In inspiration, God wants to show you the present revelation position of the spirit. And what I mean by this is my big English. 
is that he wants to show you what knowledge you have consumed before that you need to apply now. Are you there? You are not there. Um, do you realize that when you are under an attack, you don't remember? You are, about, you are in a, an accident mode. Your plane, that your, the plane, the driver has said, uh, we have lost control. Um, from the cockpit, we are saying, happy flight to the spirit world. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? It will not happen to you. It will not happen to you. It will not happen to you. You don't want to be in that position. Are you there? When you hear that kind of announcement from the cockpit, your brain is suspended. It's only what is on your heart that can speak. So what God does is that it runs a search on what you have stored in your heart. And it brings the one that is applicable to that circumstance at the spur of the moment. Then he's expecting you because he has brought it to you. He's expecting you to take it. And when you take it, don't stop saying it. That one is inspiration. The thing that is coming to you from the Holy Ghost is not entirely new. It's just that you did not know that it was supposed to be used for this situation. So the Holy Spirit goes into the archives of, of, of the data warehouse and it brings out the strategic information for the moment. And when he brings it out, he will not, he will not take it for you. You will now take it. Make it yours. Put it in your mouth and begin to say it. Because the Holy Ghost is saying it, so you also you need to say it. That's the spirit of faith. In the spirit of faith, you say what God is saying. And as you are saying it, it is coming out as if it's your word, but it's actually the words of God you are speaking, and the words of God go forth with power. That's what will release angels to walk and to hold that, that plane. Are you there? That's inspiration. But in Revelation, God takes you beyond what you know. It takes you into something that you have never known before. It goes beyond your warehouse. Are you there? So when the Bible says, call unto me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not, he's talking about revelation. You don't know it. You don't know it, but you need it. You don't know it, but you need to walk with it. It has never occurred into your heart, but the Bible says eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and it has not entered into the, the heart of man. That, that, that thing that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, that has not occurred in your heart is called a mystery. It's beyond your scope. You don't know it. He said, one of the rewards I give you for coming to me is the reward of divine Revelation. I was coming back from work. Coming back from work. Hi, my time is almost gone, and we have not started today's lecture. Hi. Those days I used to work in Abuja, and uh, they had not banned bikes then. So I would take a bus from we we'll say to Life Camp Junction, then from Life Camp Junction, I take a bike to my house. My house was in Life Camp. So I, this blessed day, I was on a bike going to my house, and then the Holy Ghost now came upon me on the bike. The bike man, I didn't know, I thought it was only me, the Holy Ghost came upon, he came upon both of us. The, the implication was that the bike man didn't know where we were going. We were just... <laughs> We were, we were just going. <laughs> Me, I was high in spirit. I was not even conscious of what was happening in the natural. I was, I was downloading. I, do you know it was on a bike I got, I got the calling for this ministry? On a bike. <laughs> the bike man passed my house and went, and we speed. 
Speed. And I realized the Holy Ghost too was, was dealing with him, but he couldn't interpret what was. There was an energy that was on him, but he couldn't interpret it. Uh, when, when, when I now got the first consignment of the download and we got lost, the back man said, oh God. <laughs> Then I told him, okay, go like this, go like this. He now dropped me off. I gave him extra money because he, he came under the weight of glory. <laughs> I entered into the gate, entered into the sitting room, and thank God, DSTV was on, Benny Hinn was doing, this is your day. In the moment I got into that place, and I started hearing Benny Hinn talk, that presence that I lost with the bike man, and the thing came back. And I... When it comes like that, I take my diary and my pen. The first thing he says was, raise for me a remnant in this generation. So I asked him, what, what is remnant? Because, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> Those things you saw on the brocure, that was the day that was downloaded, on the 25th of July, 2005. If you really have an encounter with God, the date will leave with you. It will, it will be installed. The bike man went home with more money. But I came home with more revelation. He had answers to his own prayers. I had a reward. Do you understand that? Go for a reward. Tell your neighbor. Go for this thing. Tell your neighbor this thing that we are talking about. There's, there's a reward inside. So he that cometh to God must believe. The earth is the one that must initiate the protocol. The earth must initiate the process. That's all I've been able to say today, even though... Okay, I have 18 minutes. Let me give you one. Haven't said all of this. The first definition of an altar is a supernatural landing strip. Who can tell us why planes have not yet landed in Otubo? <laughs> you are not following me. There is no infrastructure to receive planes there. There are many people that are resident in Otopo that have money, enough money to be on planes. But the reason why planes don't go there is not because of lack of money. What is required to receive it is not there. So before we talk about whether there's money, there's another more important matter which is whether the facility required to receive a plane is present. An altar is a supernatural landing strip. If you don't have an altar, the spirit world will not land in your domain. It can land with your neighbors. It can land, even a demonic dimension can land with your relatives. Land everywhere, but you, nothing lands because you don't have the infrastructure to receive these things. A supernatural landing strip. And for each definition, I'll give you scriptures to back it. But the scripture I have for this one is a long one. I'll do the scripture tomorrow, but stay with that definition. A supernatural landing strip. How many of you still remember Isaac running away, away from his brother Esau? And as he was running from home, he actually thought he was running. That's what he thought in his brain. That he was running, he was deciding where he was going. And then he came to a place that was called Lost. Evening tide had visited him. And he felt like sleeping in the open field. And then he fetched some stones. He didn't want his head to be on the level of the ground. He wanted some elevation. Got some stones and made them pillow. 
and he put his head to sleep. And unknown to him, that location was a location his grandfather set up an altar to God many years ago. In the life of Abraham, he will pitch his tent and build his altars. His altars were permanent, his tents were temporary. Today, we build tents and we pitch altars. Our dwelling places are permanent, but our altars are temporary. You can attend to your altar for two weeks in the month of January, and then in February, March, April. So what is temporary in your life is, is the altar. What is permanent is your tent. For Abraham, his altars were built. They were concrete. His tent can change. It was temporary. That's the description of a man that modeled the life of the tent and the altar. If you see the geography of the places where he set up altars, because you cannot know where his tent is. The only way to know where his tent is, is where his altars are. He was here. He was here. How do you know it? By the altar. Not by his tent. He was here. So his grandchild that knows nothing about his priesthood was escaping from home. The guy came somewhere and decided to rest. He didn't know that he was not the one that chose the place to rest. It was the place that chose him. If there's an altar in your family, maybe there's a demonic one. That altar can even determine who you marry. You don't know. You think you chose the woman. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me not trouble you. Let me not trouble. Let me leave you. You think you are so wise. This is your brain that you use in University of Agriculture. It's, it's so wise. You are so wise. No, we'll go deep. Then you will discover that you have been an object of manipulation for, for so many years. <laughs> he thought he was the one that chose where his day will end. He didn't know that the, the place chose him. And the very stones that his grandfather used to build the altar were the stones he considered to use for pillow. <laughs> when he put his head on that pillow, the only thing he could see was the result of what his grandfather had created through his priesthood. His natural eyes were closed and his spiritual eyes were open. The first thing he saw was that it was a spirit city, an angelic stronghold. The angels maintained an oscillatory motion. The Bible says that they were, they were ascending and descending. I know that in your brain, what you, you fix in your brain is descending and ascending. No. What was responsible for the oscillatory motion was the altar. So they were ascending from the altar and descending. Where, 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 the, where they are ascending from? The altar. A spirit city had been formed by a man's priesthood. I came back from my trip and then I, I was passing where I know you are aware that I, sometimes my eyes open. Where the women that came for three days dry fasting, where they did the prayer. In my wife's school, I was passing there and I saw the angel that is standing there because of that prayer. That angel is trapped there because of that altar. There are many things you don't know. It's not everybody that can die. You. Let me tell you something. Death. He doesn't know the road to some people's house. Hey. They have done that fast for how many years? Seven years. And the angel is standing there till this moment. Angels were trapped to that location. They were limited to that location. The man that set up the altar died long time. But the result of his priesthood lived on. Now, 
Do you still, can you, do you still remember what the Bible says about Abel? By, Abel? by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he received witness that he was righteous, and God testifying of his gifts, by which him being dead, yet speak the consequence of his sacrifice lived on beyond him. So the angels were ascending and descending. And above, there was a portal, an opening from the heavens to interact with the earth. And it was Jesus himself that was standing at the opening. The guy that was receiving this revelation was not, had not yet accepted the God of his ancestors. He was, was a rolling stone, he was a reggae rag. But he, what his ancestors had was strong enough to sponsor an encounter. When the guy rose up from the encounter, he negotiated the salvation with God. He said, if you can, give me food to eat. Give me clothes on my back. And bring me back again. Then I will now become, you will be my God. That means, let's discuss it. I need food. I don't know where I will get the next meal. I don't know where I will get the next change of raiment. And I'm not sure I will come back. If you do these three things, then I will know that you have power beyond my power. So I cannot submit to your authority. He negotiated the salvation with God. Can you see how faithless this young man was? He, he, you no, know, he didn't have the faith of his ancestors. Do you, re you, you think God forgot the, his negotiation? When the guy came back to that same spot, an angel came to, to arrest him, to remind him of. That was where his name changed. And it's a new name that he got by revelation that entered into the creed. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Oh, I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Who told you that the things you learned are the things that pertain to your destiny? The ones you study in school. They are great and mighty things. They are great and mighty things of which you must be shown. And the Bible says you don't know them. Can we pray in a moment? Because it says, call unto me. And I will answer you. And I will show you. Great and mighty things. The altar created that supernatural landing strip. And the earth realm played host to a spirit city, a stronghold of angels. Show me. Can you ask him? Show me. Show me. Show me great and mighty things that I do not know. Cry to him. Many of us are lost because you have not been shown things. Show me! Kilambo home is sick daily. Bresco fama halakadia. Bode keso kombo kodehi. Eske tobi nalai kobamala. Yamale do bosi ko bresko fani mande bosa yete ika makonde mazialo kobro hoske tabina kaske donde yeta balakonda ya brika takoske tamandolo axim to show you.
show me show me come sile e de cobresco fa la manda sheli mo compra ha natalia e la bobo sante ni mo coria brisca tela e la bobo senduria tarsila tadelia mantoria